And before I begin tonight's work, I do want to mention that this information that I was reading, I found it really provocative. And, um, as I mentioned, I'd worked with this material before, so I was kind of surprised at what I was now uncovering in this work right here. Um, the information that we'll talk about here tonight is not going to discredit uh, the work that is in the report right then, but it does call into question some significant elements of it. I would say it's both a flawed report and yet a successful report. And our discussion is going to examine those flaws and why it nonetheless is a success. And this, of course, begs the question, well, how can it be flawed and yet successful? And I'm going to refer to a precedent, and that is the Roberts Commission, a presidential appointed commission formed in December 1941 to investigate and report on the facts relating to the attacks on Pearl Harbor. The commission was headed by U.S. Supreme Court Associate Justice Owen J. Roberts. The commission members were military officers closely associated with the administration, and they presented their findings to Congress on January 28, 1942, just a few weeks after the attacks. History has shown that the Roberts Commission was a dishonest investigation, and it falsely placed blame on Admiral Husband Kimmel and General Walter Short through decryption of Japanese diplomatic and naval intercepts. The Roosevelt administration was well informed of what was to occur. Some have presented documented evidence that the administration, in fact, fostered the attack in order to justify a formal declaration of war. The U.S. had been informally at war with Germany since March 1941. The Roberts Report was successful, however, in that America could place blame on Kimmel and Short it could direct vengeance toward Japanese Americans and take attention away from Roosevelt, who had made repeated pledges during the 1940 election not to take the nation to war. The 9-11 Commission, officially known as the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, was created by Congress on November 27, 20. 2002, 14 months after the attack. It was a commission that wasn't supposed to be. President George W. Bush and members of his administration actively resisted its creation. They resisted it because they were concerned about questions that could be raised about the nation's preparedness under their watch, especially with an election coming up. They also resisted it because they were actively working to take the nation into a preemptive war against Iraq. America is under threat, they said, and all focus must be on the global war on terror. However, through the persistence of family members of 9-11 victims, Bush relented and the Republican-controlled House went along. Reluctantly, they gave the commission little time and less money. Nonetheless, members of the commission and its staff worked diligently, interviewed more than 1,200 people in 10 countries, and reviewed more than 2.5 million pages of documents. The final report was issued on July 22, 2004, and the document was compelling to read and it met with general approval by the public. It did not cast blame against Bush or anyone else for that matter, and the president was reelected in the fall, having recast himself as the global leader against terror. 
And then, as I mentioned, I worked extensively with the report by dramatizing it for the stage in a four-part production in 2006, and I found it to be a rich source of storytelling. And as noted since that time, other information has surfaced that brings into question portions of the report and the story that I told. The commission was following on the heels of a special House Senate committee to investigate intelligence failures. Senator Bob Graham, a Florida Democrat, had spent much of the past year consumed with his duties as chairman of the committee. Graham felt the House Senate report made it clear that the Saudi government officials had a role in 9-11. There was a direct line between the terrorists, 15 of whom were Saudis, and the government of Saudi Arabia. The draft contained a 28-page passage that detailed evidence that the Saudis in the United States had provided financial and logistical support to at least two of the 9-11 hijackers while they lived in Southern California. Graham and his investigators had become convinced that a number of the sympathetic Saudi officials, possibly within the sprawling Islamic Affairs Ministry, had known al-Qaeda terrorists and were entering the United States beginning in 2000 in preparation for some sort of an attack. Graham believed that the Saudi officials had directed spies operating in the United States to assist them. Graham, who had a reputation as a cautious, politically moderate lawmaker, felt that the facts were indisputable. The question was whether any of the evidence could be made public. The early indications from the White House were that while most of the committee's report could be made public eventually, the 28 pages about the Saudis would remain secret on national security grounds. The only bit of good news for Graham was that the Congress created an independent commission to investigate the terrorist attacks. With more time and a fresh eye, perhaps the 9-11 Commission could do what Congress had been unable to do so far, reveal the truth about what really happened. The first thing to know about the commission was the challenge in finding a willing chairperson. Initially, the president announced that former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor Henry Kissinger would be its chairman. But on December 12, 2002, when a delegation of family members of 9-11 victims met with Kissinger in his New York City office, and when asked if he had any Saudi clients, specifically clients by the name of bin Laden, the Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize winner balked. The next morning, he telephoned the White House to announce that he was resigning. He would not comply with the federal ethics law requiring him to disclose his client list as a government lobbyist. And the White House moved quickly to re find a replacement. The following day, White House political aide Carl Rove called former New Jersey Governor Thomas Keene to ask if he would be interested in chairing the commission. Keene said that he would and that later that afternoon, Chief of Staff Andrew Card contacted him to confirm his selection. And two days later, the President called to thank Keene for accepting the position. Perceived as a moderate Republican, part of Keene's appeal to the White House was the belief that he would be more sensitive than other candidates to the needs of the executive branch. That is, he would preserve executive privilege. As chairman, Keene was the only member of the uh, only member of the commission named directly by the White House. And under the law creating the panel, the four other Republican commissioners, Democratic were Party leaders, would select the other five commissioners. Initially, former Senator George Mitchell was selected as co-chairman, but he did not accept for the same reason that Kitch Kissinger stepped down. He wouldn't disclose his client list. And the selection went instead to former con Congressman Lee Hamilton. When President Bush signed the law that created the commission, the bill provided a commission with a small budget, $3 million, and a tight 18-month time frame. In comparison, the Challenger disaster investigation received a $40 million budget. 
Eventually, the commission budget was increased to $9 million. It is a polite fiction in Washington that the reports of Blue Ribbon federal commissions are written by the commissioners themselves. In truth, most of the reports are written by a professional staff led by a full-time staff director. On the 9-11 Commission, that title was the executive director, and it would be left to the executive director to manage the staff and set the direction of the investigation. On January 27, 2003, Keene and Hamilton issued a press relief announcing the hiring of a 48-year-old historian and political scientist at the University of Virginia, Philip Zeligo. Little known to Keene and Hamilton, however, Zeligo had a close past connection to the Bush administration and to one person in particular that the commission would want to investigate. Zelico and National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice had known each other since the 1980s when they were colleagues on the National Security Council in the presidency of Bush's father. Zelico left the NSC in 1991 to teach at Harvard and then moved on to Virginia to run the university's Miller Center of Public Affairs. After the younger Bush was declared president in 2000 election, Rice was named national security advisor, and she in turn placed Zelico on her transition team for the NSC. His work there was not widely known outside of the White House. When Zelico was not named as deputy national security advisor, he returned to the Miller Center. If Zelico did not get the job he wanted in the Bush administration, he was still handed an extraordinary assignment by the White House in the months after the 9-11 attacks. At Rice's urging, Zelico was the principal author of a national security strategy paper that would turn American military doctrine on its head and justify a preemptive war against an enemy that posed no immediate threat to the United States. This strategy paper formed the basis of the Bush Doctrine that was going to be used within months to justify American invasion of Iraq. Zelico had left these past partisan activities off of his resume and did not initially reveal them to Keene and Hamilton. When these particular activities did surface, they were very upsetting to the staff, but the co-chairman elected to keep Zelico. As a historian, Philip Zelico wanted to get hold of as many primary resources that he could to tell an effective story about what led up to and what happened on 9-11. That put him into direct conflict early on with White House counsel Alberto Gonzalez, who was determined to stonewall the commission on presidential documents in the same manner that he had stonewalled the earlier congressional committee. As a partisan, however, Philip Zelico had prematurely made up his mind who was to blame. Internally, it was the CIA, and externally, it was Iraq. And he went after them doggedly, even though there was little evidence, while he let other individuals and agencies escape with little examination or criticism. The first formal hearing was held on January 27th, 2003, behind the closed doors at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Keene and Hamilton opened the session with a statement of purpose and a warning. There are two things that can destroy us, Keene said. One is a leak of classified information that would give the White House an excuse all it needs to deny us material. The second is politics. Keene reminded the other commissioners that the city's vicious partisanship prevented the government from getting anything done. He didn't want, want to see that repeated on the commission that was charged with getting at the truth about a national tragedy. The conversation turned to the question of how the commission would gather information and how it would make use of its subpoena power. To Commissioner Jamie Gorelick, it was obvious. Every request made to the Bush administration for documents and other information should include a subpoena. Subpoenas did not have to be seen as threatening if they were issued routinely. A subpoena was simply evidence of the Commission's determination to get what it needed 
and if the commission held off on subpoenas until late in the investigation, there would be no time to go to court to enforce them. But Keene and Hamilton had already made up their minds on this issue. There would be no routine subpoenas. Subpoenas would be seen as too confrontational. As the commission set about its work, among the first individuals slated for inter interviewing was Robert Mueller, director of the FBI. On the morning of the attacks, Mueller had been on the job for exactly one week. The Bureau had been without a permanent director since June when Louis Free retired abruptly. Whatever his arrival date, no one could blame Mueller for what had gone so wrong at the FBI in the months and years before the attacks, but that did not make it easier for Mueller to hear the terrible stories about the Bureau, what might, how they might have prevented the attack. For example, what if someone in headquarters in Washington had acted on the pleas of FBI agents in Minnesota in August 2001 for a court warrant to inspect Zacharias Moussaoui's laptop? The French-born Muslim extremist had been arrested near a Minnesota flight school on immigration charges after alarming instructors there with his bizarre request to learn how to take off and land a Boeing 707 jumbo jet, even though he had no basic knowledge of flying. What if one of the counterterrorism supervisors in Washington had taken a few minutes to read a memo sent in July from FBI agents Kenneth Williams in Phoenix? Williams had urged the FBI headquarters to open a nationwide investigation of why so many young Arab men connected to radical Muslim groups were seeking commercial flying training. What if, in San Diego, someone had bothered to ask a veteran FBI informant to probe into the backgrounds of two mysterious young Saudi men who had been boarders in his house in 2000? The young men, Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Midar, had been identified as al-Qaeda terrorists and they would eventually board American Airlines 77 that crashed into the Pentagon. Mueller said repeatedly in the weeks after the attacks that there had been no clue within the FBI about Arab extremists seeking flight training in the United States, an assertion that would be contradicted with the disclosure of the Phoenix Memo. Mueller insisted that there had been insufficient evidence to justify a search of Musawi's laptop before September 11. This claim was also shown to be wrong when the hard drive was found to contain evidence linking Musawi to the hijacking plot. And because of this, there was sentiment on Capitol Hill and among commissioners to break up the FBI with ter terrorism investigations turned over to some sort of new domestic spy agency. Its critics believed the FBI was simply incapable of anything more than a federal police force. Within days of his appointment, Zelico met with two leading officers from the CIA. Zelico had made up his mind, had made clear to them that he felt that the CIA represented a massive failure, or excuse me, that 9-11 represented a massive failure of the CIA and that the attacks happened because the agency was not connected to the rest of the intelligence community. It was clear to these officers that Zelico had made up his mind to seek elimination of George Tennant's position as Director of Central Intelligence and to call for the creation of a National Intelligence Director. When George Tennant learned of Zelico's focus on the CIA, he thought that the two assistants had misunderstood Zelico. There was no reason to single out the CIA as being more responsible than any other agency. If any agency was responsible, it was the FBI. Furthermore, he was currently trying to address the president's claim that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction to justify a preemptive war against Iraq. No, thought Tennant. After all the warnings the CIA presented to the White House leading up to September 11th, the agency would not be made to carry the blame. In March, at the first public hearing of the commission in New York City, there was very little public response. Most of the people in attendance were family members who uh, 
family members of 9-11 victims. And what these family members heard disappointed and angered them. After announcing that the commission, after announcing what the commission would do, Keene spelled out what it wouldn't do. It did not intend to make a priority of blaming individual government officials. Quote, we will be following paths and we will follow these individual paths wherever they lead, said Keene. We may end up holding individual agencies, people, and procedures to account, but our fundamental purpose will not be to point fingers. One of the family members, Mindy Kleinberg, wanted the commission to hold someone accountable for September 11th for the death of her husband who was trapped on the 104th floor of the North Tower. She was tired of hearing the constant refrain from the Bush administration about how difficult it was to stop the terrorist attacks. How often she had heard Condoleezza Rice and others at the White House say it, quote, the terrorists only have to be lucky once while the government needs to be right 100% of the time. It seemed to Mindy that there was plenty of evidence that the 9-11 terrorists were lucky only because of bungling at the White House, FBI. had made their luck possible. An example of how poorly the Bush administration prepared the nation against the threats of terrorism was revealed in April 2003 when commission investigators dug into the Federal Aviation Administration. The <coughs> FAA's incompetence was embodied by the fact that its official no-fly watch list of potential terrorists had fewer than 20 names on it on September 11th. The State Department had its own watch list, known as TIPOC, which included 61,000 names of possible terrorists. Among the names on TIPOC were Hosmi and Madar. TIPOC was readily available to the FAA and the airlines, but the head of the FAA admitted to the commission that he was unaware that it even existed. Norman Mineta, Transportation Secretary oversaw the FAA, the Coast Guard, and other agencies. Mineta revealed to the Commission that the White House had made no special effort to warn the Transportation Department to be ready for an Al-Qaeda strike during the spring and summer of 2001. He could not remember any special interagency meeting at the White House about the threats when the CIA was warning the President almost daily about an imminent attack. The other agency responsible for making sure the skies about the United States were free from terrorist threats were, was the Department of Defense. It was supposed to work in concert with the FAA, and the FAA was supposed to alert the Pentagon, specifically the North American Aviation um, Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, at the first sign of trouble. However, the FAA and NORAD never presented to the public a consistent timeline for the events of September 11th. It was remarkable to commission investigators how often inaccurate statements were made by senior government officials in public testimony under oath. A central element of the NORAD cover story, repeated again and again after 9-11, was that the Air Force jet fighters had heroically chased United 93. Had it not crashed in Pennsylvania because of the struggle between hijackers and passengers, the plane would have been blown out of the sky before it reached its target in Washington. But the taped, telephone rec the taped recordings of air traffic controllers monitoring communication between themselves and the hijackers, recordings that had to be subpoenaed from NORAD by the commission, made it clear that every element of the cover story was wrong. NORAD knew nothing about United 93 until after it had already plunged to the ground. To the alarm of some of the more publicity-hungry commissioners, the investigation fell out of the headlines for several months in the spring and summer of 2003. It was mostly ignored by the Washington Press Corps, which had a much bigger story to cover at the time. In March, only four months after the creation of the commission, President Bush ordered the invasion of Iraq. The overthrow of Saddam Hussein was described by the White House as the next logical chapter in the war on terror that had begun on September 11th. 
The White House had originally justified the invasion as necessary because of the intelligence that Baghdad was hiding stockpiles of chemical, biological, and maybe even nuclear material from United Nations inspectors. After the invasion, when it became clear that the intelligence was disastrously wrong and there was no such deadly weapons, the administration shifted its argument. Now it justified the war by in focusing almost exclusively on the purported collaboration between Iraq and al-Qaeda. In the spring, the commission investigators returned to the CIA to review documents demonstrating the agency's effort against al-Qaeda. Unlike Zelico, these investigators were struck by the amount of activity that the CIA had been tracking and to which it had been attempting to respond. Many of the documents were from the files of the Alex Station, the special office the CIA had set up in 1996 to do nothing but track al-Qaeda. In the aftermath of 9-11, the CIA had been subjected to relentless and often justifiable criticism about its failures before the attack, but the commission investigators could also see that there were men and women who had given up the rest of their lives to the mission of tracking down Osama bin Laden. Investigators could also see that the CIA had repeatedly warned against just the sort of terrorist attack that had taken place on 9-11, that is, airplanes as weapons. Investigators also thought that the CIA archives showed that the common wisdom in Washington about the CIA and the FBI, that they were uh, locked in a tortured rivalry that prevented them from sharing information, was in many ways untrue. The CIA's leadership uh, thought that when the full story of the agency's performance was told, the agency would weather the storm of criticism. That confidence was shaken when investigators gathered files about Hazmi and Midar and determined that the CIA might have failed for more than a year to notify the FBI of the pair's presence in the United States. In August, the commission investigators went to another agency, the National Security Council. They wanted to see the personal files of National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. Her predecessor under Clinton, Sandy Berger, and Richard Clark, the NSC's counterterrorism czar for both Clinton and Bush. Investigators were startled to discover that Zelico expected to be involved in the smallest details of their work, especially since they knew how close Zelico was to Rice. It was clear to some of the investigators that they could not have an open discussion in front of Zelico about Rice and her performance as National Security Advisor. Still, investigators could make quick work of Rice's emails and internal memos on the Al-Qaeda threat in the spring and summer of 2001. That was because there was almost nothing to read, uh, at least nothing that Rice had written herself. Either she committed nothing to paper or email on the subject, which was possible since much of her work was conducted face-to-face -face with Bush, or terrorist threats were simply not an issue that interested her before 9-11. Her speeches and public appearances in the months before the attacks suggested the latter. The commission discovered the text of a speech she had been scheduled to make on September 11th in which she planned to address, quote, the threats of today and the day after, but not the work of yesterday. The speech was intended to outline her broad vision on national security and to promote the Bush administration's plan for a missile defense system included only passing reference to terrorism and the threat of radical Islam. But if Rice had left almost no paper trail on terrorism in 2001, Richard Clark's files were everything the investigators could have hoped for. In the first years in the counterterrorism job at the White House, Clark had focused on Hezbollah and Hamas and the other well-established terrorist groups in the Middle East. But by the mid-1990s, Clark saw his job largely as the hunt for one man, Osama bin Laden and the destruction of his al-Qaeda terrorist network. Clark had long predicted that bin Laden would eventually attack on American soil, possibly with weapons of mass destruction. Repeatedly in 2001, Clark had gone to Rice and others in the White House and pressed them to move urgently to respond to a flood of warnings about an upcoming and catastrophic terrorist attack 
by Osama bin Laden. Clark pushed for an early meeting in 2001 with President Bush to brief him about bin Laden's network and the nearly existential threat that it represented to the United States. But Rice rebuffed Clark. She allowed him to give a briefing to Bush on the issue of cyber terrorism, but not on bin Laden, she told Clark. She told Clark that the al-Qaeda briefing could wait until after the White House had put the finishing touches that summer on a broader campaign against bin Laden. She moved Clark and his issues off center stage, in part at the urging of Philip Zelico and the transition team. Rice had ad ad admirably resisted calls to remove Clark entirely from the White House staff, a fact that she would recall repeatedly after 9-11 in defending herself. But she had pushed Clark so far away from the center of power that his warnings through night 2001 about an imminent terrorist attack could be ignored. Investigators were struck when they found a memo written by Clark to Rice on September 4, 2001, exactly one week before the attacks, in which Clark seemed to predict what was just about to happen. And I'll read what you have before you on the screen. Are we serious about dealing with the Al-Qaeda threat? Decision makers should imagine themselves on a future day when the CSG, that is the Counterterrorism Strategy Group, had not success, succeeded in stopping al-Qaeda attacks and hundreds of Americans lay dead in several countries, including the US. What would those decision makers wish that they had done earlier? That future day could happen at any time. The investigators knew instantly that the September 4th email was so sensitive and potentially damaging that the White House would never voluntarily release a copy to the commission or allow notes of it taken in the reading room of the NSC if they came close to reproducing its language. Investigators instead memorized it in pieces, several sentences at a time, and rushed back to the commission office to document them on a computer. In the summer of 2001, the nation's news organizations, especially the television networks, were riveted to the story of one man. It wasn't George Bush, and it certainly wasn't Osama bin Laden. It was the sordid tale of an otherwise obscure Democratic congressman from Modesto, California, Gary Condon, who was implicated, falsely it later appeared, in the disappearance of 24-year-old government intern Chandra Levy, later found murdered. Even reporters in Washington who covered intelligence issues acknowledged that they were largely ignorant that summer that the CIA and other parts of the government were warning on an almost certain terrorist attack. The warnings were going straight to President Bush each morning in his briefings by Tenet and in the presidential daily briefs. The PDBs presented to Bush from January 2001 through September 2, 2001, included references to bin Laden, and nearly identical intelligence landed each morning on the desks of about 300 other senior national security officials and members of Congress in the form of the Senior Executive Intelligence Brief, or the SEEB, a newsletter or intelligence issue that was prepared by the CIA. The SEEBs contained much of the same information that was in the PDBs, but they were edited to remove material considered too sensitive for all but the president and his top aides to see. But they could read through the next best thing, the SEEBs. And what they read there showed investigators how often and aggressively the White House had been warned that something terrible was about to happen. It was especially troubling to investigators to realize how many of the warnings were directed to the desk of one person, Condoleezza Rice. And there is no record to show that Rice made any special effort to discuss terrorist threats with Bush. The record suggested, instead, that there was not a mat that it was not a matter of special interest to either of them that summer. In September, the Commission turned its attention to these PDBs. Keenan Hamilton tried to use diplomacy with the White House in gaining access to these documents, but they were met with little more than the negative response that Zelico had received a year earlier. As noted early on, 
Zilico had presented President's Counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, with a list of highly classified documents and other materials, including presidential PDBs, which the Commission needed to do its job. But Gonzalez made it clear that no such cooperation well, would be coming. Keen, like, um, likewise, tried to reason with Gonzalez, reminding him of other federal commissions formed following a national crisis. Gonzalez was unmoved. Keene expressed his frustration with Gonzalez to the New York Times, which led to a major article that angered the Bush administration and fueled attack by Democratic presidential hopefuls. The article never mentioned PDBs, even the term was deemed classified, but it indicated that the White House was withholding access to information that commissioners needed to see. The news story changed the standoff. President Bush met with White House Press Corps the following day and announced that the commission would have access to the PDBs, thereby declassifying the term as well. Intentionally or not, Bush had undermined his loyal counsel, Alberto Gonzalez, who had been so insistent that the PDBs would never be revealed to the commission. When Keene himself sat down to read the PDBs, he was terrified. Each PDB was only several pages long, so Keene himself could read through months of them in the stretch of a few hours. Here were the digests of the most important secrets that were gathered by the CIA and the nation's other spy agencies at a cost of tens of billions of dollars a year. And there was almost nothing in them. Occasionally there was something intriguing, but the PDBs often did little but repeat what had been already appearing in the front pages of the Washington Post and the New York Times. It occurred to Keene that this might be the Commission's most frightening discovery of all. The emperors of espionage had no clothes. <laughs> Nonetheless, the PDBs were filled with warnings about a coming attack, although they were maddening, maddeningly nonspecific about a time or a place. Through the spring and summer of 2001, there was a consistent drumbeat of warning day after day that al-Qaeda was about to attack the United States or its allies. The CIA had gone to the president every day with that message. Commission investigators learned that a similar message was delivered by Thomas Picard, acting director of the FBI, to Attorney General John Ashcroft. Picard, an internal replacement, gave Ashcroft his first briefing soon after Louis Free resigned. Terrorism was his number one item on the list. Ashcroft listened, but he seemed far more intrigued by other items on the agenda, especially the latest on the FBI's effort to end delays on background checks for gun buyers. In July, Picard opened his second briefing with the latest on the CIA warnings about an al-Qaeda attack. He had barely begun his presentation when Ashcroft jumped in angrily saying that he didn't want to hear any more about that since there was nothing he could do. Picard persisted and urged the Attorney General to meet with George Tennant and hear from him what was happening. Ashcroft responded by saying that he didn't want Picard to ever talk to him about Al-Qaeda or these threats again. Picard thought that the situation was absurd. Shouldn't the FBI and other law enforcement agencies that answered to Ashcroft, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the Border Patrol, the Marshal Service, be readying themselves for the possibility of an attack? Within days of the July 12 briefing, Ashcroft answered with a demonstration his lack of attention to terrorism. In its annual budget request, the FBI had asked for a sizable budget increase for only one of its divisions, counterterrorism. Ashcroft sent a letter saying that the request had been turned down. Picard appealed the decision, but he didn't hear back from Ashcroft for several weeks. On September 11th, Picard received a letter from Ashcroft written the day before. It was a denial of his request for more money for counterterrorism division. 
Realizing that the commission would reveal his inactions prior to September 11th, Ashcroft went on the offensive. At his public testimony, he accused Commissioner Jamie Gorelick of being personal, personally responsible for the attacks. When she had been serving in the Justice Department years before, she drafted a policy that placed a legal wall between the CIA and the FBI, thereby present, preventing the agencies from cooperating and sharing information. It was this wall, Ashcroft explained, said, that explained why so much had gone wrong at the FBI in 2001, including the botched handling of the Zachariah Musawi investigation and the confusion over whether Musawi's belongings could be searched. The commissioners understood that this was a gotcha moment, staged for television cameras in order to avert scrutiny of his responsibilities. The 1995 memo was mostly a restatement of what had been department policy on terrorism cases for years. The first bricks in the so-called wall were put into place in the 1980s as a result of court orders intended to protect civil liberties. It was largely a legacy of Watergate and the scandals unearthed by the church committee when the nation learned of the dangers of providing the FBI and the CIA with too much authority to spy on American citizens. Ashcroft's accusations instigated immediate death threats against the commissioner and her family. Nonetheless, from the commissioner's dais, Others began to take apart Ashcroft's allegation by noting that he made no effort to take down the wall, and in fact, he had recently endorsed the procedures. There was one bit of good news in all this. The 10 commissioners were united in their defense of Gorelick. The Republicans seemingly even more outraged than the Democrats. Furthermore, as the revelations by Ashcroft aimed at discrediting Gorelick as other, excuse me, as other revelations by Ashcroft aimed at discrediting Gorelick surfaced, the commissioners drew in President Bush and expressed to him their anger. And Bush agreed with the commissioners and pledged to slap down his attorney general, which he did. In May, the commission held a second public hearing in New York City, and at that time, the commissioners questioned the leaders of police, fire, and emergency operations. The commissioners were very critical of the city's response to the attacks at the World Trade Center, based on information that had been gathered in the preceding months. Commissioner John Lehman, former Navy secretary and a New York City resident, led with questioning of city safety chiefs and he was very critical and caustic in his questioning. And while it played well with families of fallen police, fire, and emergency operations personnel, it brought forward a backlash from the police, fire, and emergency operation Human. leader. With the unanimous report, Keene and Hamilton also wanted to prove something that they had stood for throughout their careers and that seemed to have been forgotten in American politics in the new century. That it was still possible for loyal Republicans and loyal Democrats to agree on what was best for national security. After 9-11, both believed that bipartisan cooperation in dealing with terrorist threats might be all that stood between the United States and another attack. Much as the staff felt beaten down by Zelico, so did the Democratic commissioners. By the end, they had given up their fight to document the more serious failures of Bush, Rice, and others in the administration in the months before 9-11. Zelico never would have permitted it, nor, they realized, would Keene and Hamilton. The Democrats hoped the public would read the report and understand that 9-11 did not have to happen that if the Bush administration had been more aggressive in dealing with the threats flooding into the White House from January 2001 through September 10, 2001, the plot could have been foiled. The Clinton administration could not duck blame for 
having failed to stop bin Laden before 2001. But what happened in the White House in the first eight months of George Bush's presidency had all but guaranteed that 19 young Arab men, 15 of them Saudis, armed with pocket knives, cans of mace, and a misunderstanding of the tenets of Islam could bring the United States to its knees. With the report published and well received by most people, many on the commission understood that they just helped reelect George Bush. He was seeking a second term that November on the basis of his decisiveness in dealing with Al Qaeda and other terrorist threats around the globe. Voters were being asked to believe that the terrorist threat was as dire as ever and that the Iraq war had been made necessary because of it. The commission's report did not make the accusation that the White House had feared most, that Bush and his administration had mishandled the terrorist threats before 9-11, and it reached the conclusion that the White House had most wanted the public to hear and understand that there was every reason to fear another catastrophic terrorist attack within the American border. Within days of his re-election, President Bush moved to oust Secretary of State Colin Powell. Even before Powell was told of the decision, Bush had approached National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice about replacing him. Rice quickly set about to put a new team in place. She announced that she had decided to re-establish the job of State Department counselor an all-purpose advisor who would have her ear at all time. Her candidate for the position was Philip Zeller. And that concludes this portion of the 9-11 Commission Report 10 years after. So as you see, I found it to be very provocative because, if you will, I bought, and, and as I say, it doesn't just, Philip Zelikow's presence and his influence on the selection of the commission and the direction that it had does not affect everything that's in there. So much of it is very, very informative. But two things that, that challenge for me primarily has to be the information dealing with what was going on in Afghanistan, what was going on among the terrorists, what was going on bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the so-called mastermind of the, uh, the attacks. Um, that information, as we now know, was all derived through coercive techniques, waterboarding, 100 plus waterboardings on uh, KSM as he's referred to in the report. And we have no validity if any of that information is correct. It could all be his uh, make made up. And we'll never know because, as mentioned, those tapes were destroyed by CIA agent Jose Rodriguez. And the other uh, effect was the diminishing of the responsibility of uh, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice uh, in that and the attempt to blame the CIA when in fact the CIA had been delivering, as I mentioned, almost daily messages to the president through Rice about the coming attack, even though they were not specific about the time and the place. Anything that might ways for you that came out of this, and it was a lot of information that I bring, brought forward in this year tonight, but let's see what we have here. And what we'd like to do, if I might say, to capture the audio of your questions, we'll bring a microphone up here to you, to Chris. So, hold for just a second, Chris, and we'll bring a microphone to you. Do you know if anything has greatly improved since that time? All of the cover-ups and uh, passing the buck, has anything improved? There was, and a lot of information is available online about this subject. Not so much with the date that we're commemorating with this event in this year, but on the 10th anniversary of the attacks, so that would, excuse me, that would be 2011, there were a number of uh, articles in public paper, in national papers, trying to get just at that question. And I reviewed them. As mentioned, Keene and Hamilton wanted the focus to be on going forward, 
We've got a dysfunctional system here. Let's make suggestions about how to improve it at the CI level and particularly at the FBI, FAA, and their communication with Department of Defense. And in reviewing those articles, the writers of them determined that there was very little being done to bring about changes within those departments and agencies within the U.S. government. One thing that was really startling to discover, that at the time of the attacks, the FBI did not have email. They didn't use it. They had an antiquated computer system. They were a very, very dysfunctional agency, largely because of the history under um, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who didn't allow any of that uh, carrying on with technology then. And Louis Free had been his appointed a, uh, replacement, and he had not been moving those things forward. Although there was something put in place, it just had not brought about the change. Things have happened since then, but there's still a great deal of dysfunction within these agencies. According to national columnists who looked at it uh, now uh, three years ago. Um, I would, you know, the thing that occurred to, that I took issue with Keene and Hamilton on this, they took it upon themselves to demonstrate bipartisanship with this commission right here. But that wasn't their agenda that was given to them by Congress. Their Congress said to them, find out what happened and who, what was their responsibility. But in my reading of it, how do you, the responsibility was not at the ground level or the field office level because it's shown right here and it was shown in the report. It was being reported up to by field agents in Minneapolis and in Phoenix. We've got a problem, but when it hit Washington, it just died right there. How do you replace um, the head, how do you replace uh, John Ashcroft who just didn't want to hear this stuff? He was brought this information by uh, Thomas Picard, and he just, you know, stood up and got into a shouting match with him, crossed his desk. Don't bring this stuff to me again. Blame somebody else. Blame somebody else when the time came. Um, how, you know, when you have a national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, who is receiving the information and not bringing it forward to the president. That's where the jam up in, in so much of this was going on right then. When Transportation Secretary Normanetta is unaware that all this stuff is coming down for him to alert the agencies that are reporting to him. It was, it, the system wasn't working as, as it should be. Any other things that want to come up at this time? I could go on, but I, I want to hear, engage in a little bit more. Well, you, you started, you started this hope, hope for a second. Hope, hope, for, hope for a second. Uh, you began this by comparing comparison with the report after Pearl Harbor. What similarities and what non-similarities are you finding? Just in this, I made the comparison. I, I described this report as a flawed report, and it's flawed for several reasons. One, there was a very partisan executive director who was shaping um, and had made up his mind about responsibility before they had any evidence, and consistently kept driving those at that agenda, even when contrary information was coming into it. And only at the very end did he relinquish and say uh, that Iraq was not involved um, and that, yes, there was information from the CIA to, to go after this. Um, there were flaws in the fact that they did not go after this treasure trove of information at the NSA until the last weeks of their reporting period, and they never got at the vast amount of material that was in there. And that's shut off to us today. However, it was a successful report in that when this thing was delivered, as we had talked about earlier, it's very readable and it really gives you a story. It really was compelling to me in 2006 when I read it. And the nation, if you will, bought it. The Roberts report, in the same way as they use it as a precedent is a flawed report in that, uh, more than a flawed report, it's a dishonest report. It was, and if you read about how, I won't go into it now, but Roosevelt uh, appointed a friendly justice who had a good name 
He appointed military officers that were close to him and close to George Marshall. Um, and they effectively told a false story about their actions and cast blame on the two leading officers, Kimmel and uh, Short, on, on duty in Pearl Harbor at that time, and who had no ability to defend themselves at the time. Later on, they did, without going into that whole subject at the moment, um, a report came out mere weeks after Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt, it was not really a congressional report, Roosevelt took that report and handed it to his staff and said, give it to the press and tell them to run with it. And that report, you know, falsely is blaming Kimmel and Short, who all began to have death threats against them, the same way as Jamie Gorelick had death threats thrown against her falsely because of Ashcroft's attack. And, you know, it just set up the whole nation to think this was an, a, a surprise attack, when in fact the administration through them, you know, it said naval and diplomatic uh, uh, intercepts, knew everything that was going on, but wanted the attack looking for a, a, a reason for being able to declare war. So it was, this report, same way with the Republic's report, was flawed, but it was successful in it. It achieved the results that the administration was looking for. You know, if the medical profession oh, worked go, that go, way, go you know, go ahead. hanging on to, to their prejudices and so forth, we'd still be using leeches and bloodletting. Uh, where do you get honest people to investigate? Um, you know, a good question. Through 10 years after, last year, we explored the um, nine, excuse me, the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, and we talked at that part about the report about that. There was a very thorough and uh, investigation of how that shuttle disintegrated on reentry right there, and I mean there were tens of millions of dollars spent on that report. In the same way. In the 1980s, with the Challenger disaster, very thorough discussion, and in fact, most people well, they, weren't they looking for the truth, though, and the real reason. Ex exactly. So those were those were commissions that indeed, uh, you know, there was an honest attempt right from the beginning, and in fact, and I think that that you know, Keen and Hamilton were really looking for the truth in this, but there was, you know, built in. There was some built in obstacles as well as some that they took on themselves. As I said, when Zellico signed up for the job, he was very attractive to him, and he came recommended by a number of people, but he intentionally left off a lot of his partisan activities that would have been red flags to Keenan Hamilton, but once they accepted him, they kept him. And Zellico was a very critical element in this, uh, the process of writing this report. One thing that he pointed out very early on, Zellico sat down with um, with May, who I mentioned then, who's a really a notable and a credible historian. Um, they put together the structure of how the report was going to read. Even before it had been written, they structured it and they kept it secret. And Zellico put the chapters dealing with the Bush administration in the middle, thinking that It'll take read the casual reader a long time to read through it and not get to that. Whereas if that was put at the beginning, there'd be a lot more questions raised about what was going on. But they're buried in the middle of the chapters. So that's an example of the, the kind of slag of hand that was going on by a key member of the commission staff. John, I was going to ask you uh, how you feel after this extensive investigation. Uh, what do you feel about how our system survives at all with this kind of duplicity, uh, distorted personal agendas that go against the public good? 
The thought that occurred to me as I was reading about this latest act of, of irrational violence up in Santa Barbara, uh, Columbine, all these random mm -hmm. shootings, the thing that I thought about was why aren't there more? For example, when uh, McNamara, an architect of the U.S. policy in Vietnam, one day in his retirement says, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I lied. And when you see uh, this program that you've just uh, done so professionally and objectively, it just amazes me that more shootings don't occur. Uh, shootings by the relatives and loved ones of hundreds and thousands of people who went to their deaths for no good reason. Weapons of mass destruction as a rationale that gets us into Iraq. Thousands die. And I just wondered, if I were a parent and my child had died for such a worthless cause, what would I do? Well, to answer the question right there, I think our nation is so vulnerable, continues to be vulnerable, because of both elected, but also the appointed officials who are heading up these agencies, who through their own um, dis uninterest or laziness or political viewpoint do not pursue um, their responsibilities. As someone said, when mistakes happen in government, always someone is accountable. When, it, when something, when, a, when a, a figure has the authority to act and they choose not to act or act against the law, there's an accountability that needs to be there. And to be avoiding that is what gives rise to what we have seen. And so obviously the appointment of uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice from National Security Advisor, then to Secretary of State, from Alberto Gonzalez, from uh, White House counselor to become uh, uh, attorney general. Um, instead of bringing these people to task, they were promoted to higher positions of authority. And uh, what I'm not saying, though, that this is just a Republican problem. This would be a Democratic problem as well. This is a, this is a nature of our system here. What so is I think the moral compass of right and wrong? It's, go ahead. They sell out to the politics. As I say, where is the moral compass? Where is right and wrong? Black and white. Yeah. There, there's, I'll, I'll quote, I've been listening to um, um, Mark Twain's autobiography on DVD. And Twain says that there's a surprising a lot of physical courage among Americans but there's very little moral courage to take on a power figure or to challenge the conventional wisdom. People think twice. They'll run into gunfire and bombs and dive into a you know, rushing ice stream to save someone, but to challenge authority, uh, I'll get back to you. So that was Mark Twain, so we haven't learned very much in the last 100 years. And he was commenting about, you know, late 19th, early 20th century and what he was witnessing among people. Elections coming up. <laughs> well, I think it's, in, you know, as I said, I think it's a lot of it is endemic, you know, but there, you, we do have, you know, which isn't to say, as I said, many... You know, so many of the people that are in government, conscientious, hardworking, and and courageous. Um, but then I think as you move higher up the food chain, that courage drops off, and they're really looking out for their uh, their career. And the next election. And the next election. Any of uh, oh, we have one right here. And. So with that last comment, is the problem with our system or with, um, I guess, the moral shortcomings of our people? You know, I think that that's a, 
Yeah. I can leave that. I'll I, I, no, no, hand over here to, for just a sec. Well, I'm going to speak as a teacher and as someone who served as a local city council in Gardena. I think that every time a teacher promotes a student for simply social reasons or, or political reasons or because you just don't give a damn, just let them get through and you won't bitch and moan and PTA with meetings will go smoothly. Whenever a teacher abrogates his or her responsibility, whenever local citizens vote for a, a, a person who has the most flyers, uh, that's where the system goes wrong. Forget about blaming people at the top to begin with. All policies are local. And as a former teacher and as a former city councilman, I see the problems beginning at the local level. We have nobody to blame up there if we haven't done our duty down here in the bottom at of the At conception. Sentence. What's that? <laughs> Almost at conception. That's right, really. Uh, my accomplished artist friend, Mary Higuchi, is a retired elementary school teacher. And we often comment that as a college professor and an elementary school teacher, we had a lot in common. Because if she didn't instill in her students basic values such as honesty and having DNA that enables you to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, uh, those students who aren't taught those things would never have appeared in my classes at all. And so we are each other's keeper, starting at the lowest level. So let's not blame the higher-ups unless we do our duty as citizens. Because look at the local elections. I mean, how, much, uh, how much money is coming into this crap that we get in our mailboxes from people who have no business being elected to anything, except they've got big money behind them. So. And how it, many people don't go vote? That's right. If there is a problem, we are the problem at this level. You know, there's a, I'm referred to another wonderful 19th century story. Um, you're familiar with, um, oh, I wanted to make reference, but I'll, I'll come into it, back up for a second. Also on the table up here is a pullout from recent copy of the LA Times, which is a story by the architectural editor. That our report came out for the mere weeks after Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt, it was not really a congressional report, Roosevelt took that report and handed it to his staff and said, give it to the press and tell them to run with it. And that report, you know, falsely is blaming Kimmel and Short, who all began to have death threats against them, the same way as Jamie Gorelick had death threats thrown against her falsely because of Ashcroft's attack. And, you know, it just set up the whole nation to think, this was an, a, a surprise attack, when in fact the administration, through the, you know, it said naval and diplomatic uh, uh, intercept, knew everything that was going on, but wanted the attack looking for a, a, a reason for being able to declare war. So it was, so this report, same way with the Republic's report, was flawed, but it was successful and it had achieved the results that the administration was looking for. You know, if the medical profession oh, worked go, that go, way, go you know, go ahead. hanging on to their prejudices and so forth, we'd still be using leeches and bloodletting. Uh, where do you get honest people to investigate? Um, you know, a good question. Through 10 years after, last year, we explored the um, nine, excuse me, the Columbia Space Shuttle disaster, and we talked at that part about the report about that. There was a very thorough and uh, investigation of how that shuttle disintegrated on reentry right there, and I mean there were tens of millions of dollars spent on that report. In the same way in the 1980s with the Challenger disaster. Very thorough discussion. And in fact, most people... Well, they, weren't they looking for the truth, though, and the real reason? Ex exactly. So those were, those were commissions that indeed uh, 
know, there was an honest attempt right from the beginning, and and, fun. and I think that that you know Keen and Hamilton were really looking for the truth in this, but there was you know built in there was some built in obstacles, as well as some that they took on themselves. As I said. When Zelico signed up for the job, he was very attractive to him, and he came recommended by a number of people, but he intentionally left off a lot of his partisan activities that would have been red flags to Keenan Hamilton. But once they accepted him, they kept him. And Zelico was a very critical element in this, uh, the process of writing this report. One thing that he pointed out very early on, Zelico sat down with um, with May, who I mentioned then, who's a really a notable and a credible historian. Um, they put together the structure of how the report was going to read. Even before it had been written, they structured it, and they kept it secret. And Zelico put the chapters dealing with the Bush administration in the middle, thinking that It'll take read the casual reader a long time to read through it and not get to that. Whereas if that was put at the beginning, there'd be a lot more questions raised about what was going on. But they're buried in the middle of the chapters. So that's an example of the, the kind of sleight of hand that was going on by a key member of the commission staff. John, I was going to ask you uh, how you feel after this extensive investigation. Uh, what do you feel about how our system survives at all with this kind of duplicity, uh, distorted personal agendas that go against the public good? The thought that occurred to me as I was reading about this latest act of, of irrational violence up in Santa Barbara, uh, Columbine, all these random shootings. The thing that I thought about was why aren't there more? For example, when uh, McNamara, an architect of the U.S. policy in Vietnam, one day in his retirement says, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I lied. And when you see uh, this program that you just uh, done so professionally and objectively. It just amazes me that more shootings don't occur. Uh, shootings by the relatives and loved ones of hundreds and thousands of people who went to their deaths for no good reason. Weapons of mass destruction as a rationale that gets us into Iraq. Thousands die. And I just wondered, if I were a parent and my child had died for such a worthless cause, what would I do? Well, to answer the question right there, I think our nation is so vulnerable, continues to be vulnerable, because of both elected but also the appointed officials who are heading up these agencies who through their own um, dis uninterest or laziness or political viewpoint do not pursue um, their responsibilities. As someone said, when mistakes happen in government, always someone is accountable. When, it, when something, when, a, when a, a figure has the authority to act and they choose not to act or act against the law, there's an accountability that needs to be there. And to be avoiding that is what gives rise to what we had seen. And so, obviously, the, the appointment of uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice from National Security Advisor, then to Secretary of State, from Alberto Gonzalez, from uh, White House Counselor to become uh, uh, Attorney General, um, instead of bringing these people to task, they were promoted to higher positions of authority. And what I'm not saying, though, that this is just a Republican problem. This would be a Democratic problem as well. This is a this is a nature of our system here. So Where's I think the moral compass, the right and wrong. It's go ahead. They sell out to the politics. As I say, where is the moral compass? Where is right and wrong? Black and white. Yeah. There. 
there is, I'll, I'll quote, I've been listening to um, um, Mark Twain's autobiography on DVD, and Twain says that there's a surprising a lot of physical courage among Americans, but there's very little moral courage to take on a power figure or to challenge the conventional wisdom. People think twice. They'll run into gunfire and bombs and dive into a you know, rushing ice stream to save someone, but to challenge authority? Uh, I'll get back to you. So that was Mark Twain. So we haven't learned very much in the last 100 years. And he was commenting about, you know, late 19th, early 20th century and what he was witnessing among people. Elections coming up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's, in, you know, as I said, I think it's a lot of it is endemic. You know, but there, you, we do have, you know, which isn't to say, as I said, many, you know, so many of the people that are in government, conscientious, hardworking, and, and courageous. Um, but then I think as you move higher up the food chain, that courage drops off, and they're really looking out for their, uh, their career. And the next election. And the next election. Any of, oh, we have one right here. Yeah. So with that last comment, is the problem with our system or with, um, I guess, the moral shortcomings of our people? You know, I think that that's a, I can leave that, to, let, I, I'll hand over here to, for just a sec. Well, I'm going to speak as a teacher and as someone who served as a local city councilman in Gardena. I think that every time a teacher promotes a student for simply social reasons or, or political reasons, or because you just don't give a damn, just let them get through, and you won't bitch and moan, and PT with meetings to go smoothly. Whenever a teacher abrogates his or her responsibility, whenever local citizens vote for a person who has the most flyers, uh, that's where the system goes wrong. Forget about blaming people at the top to gain them. All politics are local. And as a former teacher and as a former city councilman, I see the problems beginning at the local level. We have nobody to blame up there if we haven't done our duty down here in the bottom at of the At conception. Church. What's that? <laughs> Almost at conception. That's right, really. Uh, my accomplished artist friend Mary Higuchi is a retired elementary school teacher. And we often comment that as a college professor and an elementary school teacher, we had a lot in common. Because if she didn't instill in her students basic values such as honesty and having DNA that enables you to say, I was wrong, I'm sorry, uh, those students who aren't taught those things would never have appeared in my classes at all. And so we are each other's keeper, starting at the lowest level. So let's not blame the higher-ups unless we do our duty as citizens. Because look at the local elections. I mean, how, much, uh, how much money is coming into this crap that we get in our mailboxes from people who have no business being elected to anything, except they've got big money behind them. So. And how it, many people don't go vote? That's right. If there is a problem, we are the problem at this level. You know, there's a, I'm referred to another wonderful 19th century story. Um, you're familiar with, um, oh, I wanted to make reference to it. I'll, I'll, I'll come into it, back up for a second. Also on the table up here is a pullout from recent copy of the LA Times, which is, a story by the architectural editor of our uh, column museum Excellent. at the World Trade Center right there. And he, if you haven't read it, you take a look here, you can also find it online. He talks about the physical structure of the museum. And he talks about 
why they questions why they built it and accessorized it the way that they did, because it's filled with concrete or physical objects from the, the the attack that day in New York City, and less being designed by curators and designers and telling a much more concise curated story. And what I, my feeling about it is that we're, we are really making this story all about the victims in that the World Trade Center that day, instead of the much larger story that was going on in the world and in the years before. What I had tried to do with dramatizing it was to say, because it was, as I said, it was shocking to me on that day when the attacks happened. Where did this come from? And so it was so revealing to read about through the report there, and then to be able to dramatize those events in 98 and 99 and 2000. And boy, when you can see it laid out like that, this is a thing that's just coming. And people within our government, the highest levels of our government, understood it. Richard Clark, probably most preeminent. Um, <coughs> but that story is diminished now, and it's all about the victimization to us as a nation, as shown by all that destroyed stuff that this museum now has. How many millions? I, I, it's in the art. It's, it's, an, it's tens of millions of dollars for that. Right? Right. It's a fascinating article to read. And I think the, the um, architectural reviewer um, gave a wonderful search. So I would encourage you to read it. You can get it online if you haven't. Yeah, I've read it. Which will lead me to my story, where I was going to refer to them. That wonderful line from the John Ford movie, the man who shot Liberty Valance, delivered at the very end. When the legend, when the story, when the fact, I should, when the fact becomes legend, print the legend. And I have a feeling that we are printing the legend of 9/11. And the report itself, in its sense, is kind of the legend of 9-11, and not really the full story that May was criticizing Zelico about. You haven't captured it right here, and really gotten at all the elements that go into it. Any? Who's gonna? Who's gonna? When will the revised report come? Well, I, I, here's something that occurred. The one thing I was going to mention it as an opening here, but you know, because I know most of you, I, I didn't think it would be on your thoughts initially. But I was going to say that we wouldn't be covering in tonight's report here anything about the questions of the collapse of the buildings at the World Trade Center, the two towers, and most notably, Building 7. Mm. That, more than anything, continues to reverberate among people. And it is the collapse of Building 7 that is most troubling to many people. And it's the government's report on Building 7 that is, I will say, clearly falsified and has been shown to be inaccurate by independent uh, Americans, that that part of the story is what's being dug at right now by individuals. The government won't go at the, I don't. I can't see the government going at this because it's it's basically saying, we, we didn't do our job right the first time. There were all these factors there the first time. But I think that people going at the buildings issue privately, I mean, there's a, a wonderful, there's a lot of things that are out. I accepted, you know, the collapse of these buildings under this thing when they happened. And when the questions initially raised, there was articles by scientists and, you know, in popular science that said, oh, it's so easily explained by this. Well, my investigation in putting this report together, I've really gone in and looked at a lot of new stuff that wasn't available even 
uh, in, certainly around 2006, that really raises questions about those buildings and their, their collapse. That is, you know, and, which I don't want to get into tonight, <coughs> but it's really very, very troubling. Building 7? That specifically I'll refer to Building 7. The Building 7 came down through a controlled demolition. The demolition had been set in the two towers and Building 7, and that those are what brought the building down, not the fire up on the upper stores. And I know that's really troubling to hear. That, that's a conspiracy theory, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a theory. I, won't, I used to call it a conspiracy theory, but information is being brought forward by a number of people, and particularly, as I mentioned, Building 7, that really is very troubling to me right now. But that, so it, I guess to answer the question right there, that's how it will be questioned. People are going to go at the buildings issue because there's a lot of, of videographic information that's available that is measurable. John? Again, I want to commend El Camino College for supporting you. Look around this group. We are a pretty small uh, cast of characters who follow John, but thank God for El Camino College uh, for supporting a program like this. I just hope that we'll be uh, reinforced with a few people who are younger than us uh, to carry on the message. And so my final question is, what is your next project, John? Well, we were talking about that earlier. There. 2005, what are, <laughs> we're open to suggestions. Anything that you'd like to cover for 2005, we'll take a look at that. I want to, I want to acknowledge um, Torrance City Cable for coming and yeah. capturing this program and making it available to members of the community um, who otherwise are not here or couldn't be here and to make it more accessible. And we'll be doing the same through our own uh, uh, separate uh, recording of this and put that up on YouTube so people can can, can experience it there. You know, and, you know, question this thing, all that we try to do is to provoke their own investigation. What I always try to include in this, the definition of history is to find out. And implicitly it means to find out for yourself. So if anything I've said here tonight intrigues you, we all are walking around with the tools of investigation in our pockets today or the library cards that give us access to those vast resources there. As I said, I, I have four library cards in my wallet and I use every one of them regularly. So they're a tremendous resource as well as the, uh, the, the, the net. Um, any, any further questions anyone want to add to this? No, that's, that's physically exhausting, <laughs> reading. <laughs> Solid for that period of time. Don't say that. Don't it's, say it's exhausting. It's remarkable. The, the writing that goes into that. There's, I don't know how, how many words are involved, but it's really a physical and scholarly achievement. It shouldn't be rebroadcast. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge my wife, Debbie, who is operating this uh, <laughs> Debbie graduated from Cal State Long Beach this past week. Hey. And she graduated magna cum laude in her field of interior architecture. And it's about five year BFA program and she worked very hard and achieved much success with it. So and I'm, a minor in women's studies. And a minor in women's <laughs> studies. Oh, wonderful. So. Does that affect uh, uh, women's future topics? <laughs> I'm well, hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> so it, um, she was not able to be with us at our earlier meeting because of school, but I asked her to be with us here tonight, and I'm grateful to her. Thank you. And I want to thank each of you for being part of this, um, and I look forward to further adventures 
down the road. And Ed and your crew, thank you very much for capturing and sharing this program with the community throughout the year.